Boom! The ultimate secret to holy power. Blessings and much love to everybody at Anointed Live Mentorship International. We are live! This is our Saturday Night Live. Hydrate! Why is that waiting for everybody to come on here? <clears throat> All right, as you're coming on, don't be afraid to drop a comment in the comment section. Let's get this rolling. Let's get this rolling. Let's get this rolling. Shout out to Holy Sister Monica Poiton. Blessings and much love. Blessings and much love, Holy Sister. And of course, the Holy Brother Norman Pigeon. Blessings and much love to you too. Alright, while you're all coming on, someone give someone, with, with someone, please, please, please give me a sound check. Sound check, sound check, 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 sound check. So we are actually starting a little late here tonight. I, was, I actually ran late tonight. And I, I was supposed to start at 10 p.m. ET and I'm actually starting at half 10. All right, so the objective here is to keep this within 90 minutes. That's the great objective. <laughs> All right, so let's see how we can do this and do it succinctly. So why is it coming on? If you if if you know anyone in the group in particular who you know wanted to be here, please let them know that we are here. Please let them know that we are here. So we are getting rolling. So I'm not seeing any comments here as yet. Is anybody um come back on there? Does everybody come in? We coming in. Why is it coming in? Please tag somebody in the comment section. Let them know that we are here. And leave a comment in the comment section. Let me know who is here. Why is he doing that? So for those of you that does not coming in, if you don't have a Bible, tonight you will need it, right? We're gonna be we're gonna move in across some scriptures here tonight. So tonight you will need it. Alright. Okay, so tonight. Alright, shout out to Holy Sister Sybil Kavanagh. Blessings and much love, Holy Sister. Blessings and much love to you. Alright. Why are you doing that? All right, so let's get cracking. All right, would everyone just wait? Let's hold one second here. I think what I, what I forgot to do is attack everybody on this. Let's attack every. Let's attack everybody on this. Hold on, hold one second. We just we just running across the computer, no man. <laughs>
Kiro. Very sleep. Come back here. All right. Most material is. All right. Nice. So let's get rolling. So bless, uh, formal blessings and much love to everybody who is actually joining us. Alright, I, I just shouted out Holy Sister Monica as well as Holy Brother Norman. And of course, Holy Sister Sybil. I want to say Holy Sister Kimberly Thomas. Blessings and much love. Uh, I just getting, we're just getting tucked in at the table here. Great. Nice. So tonight, the topic that we are on here tonight is the topic that we are on here tonight is specific to power. Now, most of us here in particular, before I get started, would anyone like to actually just comment in the comment section? Um, this is this is just for the sake of you becoming aware. Of what you have thought about this in your simple words what do you think the power of God is and what is its justification any one of these questions you can answer what do you think the power of God is and What is the actual justification for the power of God? Leave that in the comment section. Alright, now whilst you're doing that, I think it's necessary for me to really start all this live. Shout out to Holy Sister Lisa Dengel, joining us in the comment section as well. Alright, she actually made a comment and got a B+. <laughs> okay. Um... So before we actually get started here, you know, most of the times the best thing for us to do, and you all, this is why you all see me, usually I begin with identifying what we have been taught in the Western Christian community. Because what we are taught in the Western Christian community is what is actually what has been dominating us. It is actually what has been dominating our lives. And within the last few lives in particular, I think that I can safely say that we have been able to comfortably see that some of these concepts that we have been living with are the actual are the concepts that have been the bane, the bane of our faith and the bane of our, let's say, our effectiveness as believers in grace. It's the bane, it has been the bane of our faith and it has been the bane of our effectiveness in the name of Jesus. Now, one of the things in particular that we have been taught about the power of God, you know, we did a live that actually spoke about applying power, and we spoke about that in the context of being authoritative. All right? Holy Sister Sibyl says the power of God is that he has all authority in heaven and earth and under the earth. All right. Okay. So what one of the things in that, that we covered was um, the posture of power, right? Which is being authoritative. And we took it through the, through, through the book of Deuteronomy, which I said is like priestly gold. We took it through the book of Deuteronomy to show you how the scriptures, particularly in, in, the, in the Old Testament, it demonstrates the, it literally demonstrates the, um, the New Covenant realities in the Old Testament via the entire construct. Because what God, what God with, did with man in the Mosaic system was really take what was initially breathed into man and because he could not reproduce it from his own spirit, God had Moses install a physical realm for them to interface with. So technically, 
This was God actually just creating an interim system for the species to thrive because the garden was in them and now God made it outside of them so that they could interface with it because that is what they were created to be with. That is what they were created to express. And we, show, we, we took it through the book of Deuteronomy and showed you how the uncircumcised nation represents the darkness. And, this, and, and, and the circumcised nation, in this case Israel, in the name, in the new covenant, that's you. And we showed, we showed you how, what God's perspective was when he spoke to his people and told them how to approach the darkness. To do not fear, do not, do, do not worry, do not be anxious, do not panic. But to stand and to literally take the war to them okay now even though that session in particular stands on its own in that context it stands to give you the posture i think it was it is very necessary for you to understand where the hinges for that power so you have the posture where the hinges for that power and that is actually intimately tied into the law of sacrifice. But there's a component in the Bible that you see in the Bible, you have been reading all along, that is related to the power of God. And Paul himself says that he didn't want to know anything but Christ crucified. Because to, to, to those who are perishing, it is foolishness. But to those who are in Christ, those who are, who, are, who, who, who are saved, it is the power of God. So he literally says something in particular that is tied to that. He said that the cross of Christ, Christ crucified, is the power of God to those who are saved. Now most of us hear that, and I guarantee you that you've heard that for so long, it probably has become cliché. But there is great scriptural significance to that. And if you have interpreted that through the Western world, through the Western concept of what that is saying, what you may have done is pictured, is pictured the fact that Jesus was crucified. And so you say what he said, but you do not know how to apply what he said. Can anyone here resonate with the fact that you have heard what he said, but you do not, you have not learned how to apply what he said to see supernatural power? Just respond in the comment section for me, please. How does he apply that? Can you see? I'm saying that I'm so this is I'm, I'm trying to question again. Can you see that you have heard that? But you don't exactly know how to apply that. And how many of us can say, how many of us can say that you're not too sure what that means? Right, Holy Brother says yes. This is not. Th this is true. Uh, um, that's this. Yeah, this is true. Okay. Anybody else? No, just be real. Just be real. Right, me. Okay. Now I want you all to be brutally honest with yourselves when it comes to this. Because one of the things that right mind renewal, re re one of the things that mind renewal requires. Is that you be brutally honest with the pre-existing logic to be able to identify it and when you identify it then you have to invalidate it and when you invalidate it only then does your spirit re only then does your spirit release it and when I say spirit here in this context we could say in the context of, of what I am saying here we can also use the psychological word to say that only when you identify it and you invalidate it does your subconscious release it. These are keys. That what I just told you there. The entire Western psychological world does not know it. 
So what we have is a lot of people going to, to, to psychologists and sitting down with psychologists for a long time, for months, possibly years. And what most people tend to do is that to, to try to get to the subconscious, what they do is they, they write affirmations and they repeat the affirmations. Now, even though the affirmations may help them, it's going to take a long time. You know why? Because your spirit, a.k.a. what psychology refers to as your subconscious, does not, does not accept anything of its own until it is actually something that it knows to be true. And if it and it only knows it, it only knows something to be true, either by you have been in a position where the, it has been constantly inculcated, so you just could it, hear 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 it, until your, your subconscious accepts it to be true, or it's something that you have actually used, and you may not have gotten perfect results, but you use it, you applied it. And you got some sort of semblance of results, and your and, and your spirit has held on to it. And the only way most people will actually go through psychology or they go through affirmations to constantly repeat, which may take a long, long, long time. Or you could do it the ancient priestly way, which is they understand that you're self-existent, and if you're self-existent, then you're self-determining. Which means whatever is in your was in, is in your spirit was accepted. Your spirit has accepted as truth, A.K.A. what your subconscious has accepted as true using the psychological the the, 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 the psychological jargon. What accept, what is accepted to be is um, as true. It's something in particular that you have self determined to be true whether it's by consistent inculcation or you applied it. You may not have gotten results, but you practically applied it. And because that's only that which you know and you didn't really apply it with logic to verify if it is working or not, you were just told to do that. You did it. Your, your, your spirit has adopted it. You have self-determined that that is true. And the only way to change that and to renew your mind truly is to invalidate that which you have self-determined to be true. And when you invalidate it adequately, your spirit releases it immediately. And right there, if you don't have something to renew your mind to, most persons could actually feel like they're going through a sense of feeling lost or they feel as though they may if it is not if they if they are not guided properly or they have not really done the homework that is necessary they can feel as though they've fallen into a sense of um a sense of i don't want to say i don't want to use any word here that may give a false impression but they may feel a sense of feeling lost Right? Which is how most people feel when they come to the realization that what they have been studying in, 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 in Western religion is simply not making sense. And when they find any semblance of information that actually says this is not true because they have not been introduced to that which is true and logical or they may not know how to sit down and to reason their way into something that is logical they end up feeling lost. How many of us here could say, if you are here, if you are here listening to this lie right now, you knew something before, you knew that it was not working, and most likely you've been, you've been around and feeling lost. How many of us could say that that is true? Just type true in the comment section. We are not trying to condemn you, but what I'm trying to do is, is to actually show you that if you have that information in your spirit, in your spirit is self-determining, 
only you could invalidate it. And when you invalidate it, then you need to educate yourself on a practical and true logic to, for your spirit to be able to take it and for you to begin to function from that. Which means, this is different than Joe, Dr. Joseph and Ryan Scott. Well, I cannot tell you, Holy Sister, um, Holy Sister Jennifer, about the dispenser camp, not the Brian Scott camp. I can't say that I've actually spent time studying the content, but I can tell you that at the, in the, at the International Institute of Hematology, we have practically experimented with these things, like hands-on application, literally. Exactly what they taught in the ancient priesthood, and we've seen it to be true. Whilst most persons spend 21 days, according to the science, to renew their mind because they don't understand what spirit is and how it works. The good old-fashioned Bible that everybody has been holding in their hand, that they've been viewing through the lens of Roman perspectives of the Bible, has always had the priestly perspectives, the name of God, and how they applied it in, the ancient, in, in, in ancient Israel, how Jesus understood it. And through that perspective, you can have your spirit switch logic like that. Because it is understanding that you are self-determined and whatever is in your sub subconscious, you validated it. And for you to switch your, to left for your subconscious to let go of a thought, what you need to do is to identify the logic that you put there by your own validation. Because you are self-determining, therefore you are self-validating. And when you identify it and then invalidate it, your spirit releases it like no different from um, what's a good example your spirit will release it no different from a leech releasing its host it'll just let it go and right there you have a responsibility to educate on a new logic and then validate it with practical application. This we do at the Institute. I've been coaching persons for a long time. And there is not one person that I have coached that has been with me that is... So how would you invalidate it? An example, thanks. Okay. But hold on. All, everyone that we've dealt with, <laughs> in one coaching session, what has been there for 30 and 40 years, in one coaching session, we identify the, the reference point that they, that they used to come up with that logic, then we invalidate it. And in one coaching session, their the consciousness switched. This is not... I'm not even trying to exaggerate. What we do, what we have been doing at the Institute, we have been doing for the last five to six years consistently. Consistently. There's nobody that's actually coming to coaching at the Institute and, I, and actually walk them through that mind renewal process. And we will not only walk them through that mind renewal process just for your spirituality, like for you. We have 12 different areas of life and we identify all of your priorities and the main priority that causes you to choose those various priorities. And most of us use things from your childhood or some trauma or your familial culture, your familial validation. It's, it's always something related to, usually those things, something related to that, that you identify and you have been making decisions, make, using that as a reference point for so long. And all it took is for you to identify what the priority is and then invalidate it. How do you invalidate it? What you, all you need to do is to just be real with yourself and identify all of the fruits or lack of fruits rather and all of the things that that priority 
has actually caused you to suffer. Whilst Western Christianity has taught Satan has, Satan has been attacking you, ancient priesthood teaches that everything that is going on in your life is a result of, a, of decisions that you have made based on your pre-existing priority. And so you are responsible for your experience because of a priority that you have chosen and that you have used as a point of comparison to validate your decisions. Now, this is a separate topic. I hope I've answered it there, Holy Sister Monica. And yes, in the name Yahweh. But this is a separate topic. And if we start this topic, we will be in a different course here tonight. <laughs> right? So what we are talking about, the reason why I've spoken about that day in particular, I actually just touched the idea of what you have been using for power. Um, the, the idea of what you've been validating and what has been what you've been functioning from. Because when it comes to supernatural power, most of us have actually been re reading what Paul is saying. But you've actually applied it abstractly. I will even dare say that you applied it philosophically. Like everything that Paul said in the Bible, 99.9% .9 of Western believers apply it philosophically. What do I mean by that? You read it and you use your feelings to interpret what he's saying. There is no tangible reference point. There is no tangible there is no tangible um, application of what you learn. So what we do is that we use our feelings to interpret what he's saying. To gather or to harness some sort of sentiment with regards to what he says. And you walk off with a feel-good moment. But if they ask you how to apply that, you don't even know where to start. Does that make sense, everybody? If that makes sense, type sense in the comment section. Now, whilst we in the Western community have actually used... Shout out to the Holy Sister Tiffany Lynn also join us in the comment section. Right. So whilst you have been using your emotions to try to give you context to what Paul is saying, what you have done is when you get the emotion and a conversation comes up, you find yourself amongst the believers and you want to demonstrate that you have a grasp of what Paul is saying, you begin to express and you use your English language to articulate the feeling that you have arrived at whilst you cannot heal a fly. Now there is something that is gravely wrong with this because Jesus says those who believe in me will do the works that I do and greater. Yes? John fourteen twelve. Those who believe in me will do the things will do the works that I do and greater. So confusion or not getting it regarding communion, body and blood, emotion like a relationship with God. Exactly. Most of us in particular even actually try our understanding of relationship, most of us have been taught that you need to build a relationship with God. None of these concepts are in the Bible. No? I dare you to go in the Bible and find any one person or even, or even the sheep in the corner, in the, in the, the sheep in the corner of the pen. That was building a relationship with God. Anybody ever seen any Bible? Has anybody ever seen anything written in the Bible about building a relationship with God? 
think about it seriously. Respond, everybody. Has anybody ever seen that in the Bible? Yet you were taught that. And what is the relationship God that, that you're trying to build? A feeling of connect of being connected to Him. And the reason for this is that you were never introduced to Christ from the perspective of covenant. You were introduced to Christ as somebody who saved you from sins, and then you used Him as the moral compass or, or the moral standard for you to be a good person and then you live life you continue to live the life that you have already been living just trying to do it with a higher moral standard and Jesus was the moral standard let me ask you a question listen to this question Shout out to Holy Sister Laurie Flugra joining us. Holy Sister, Holy Brother Chris Borden Kircher. Blessings and much love. Blessings and much love. Let me ask you a question. If right now, any one of you, and those of you who are actually renting, right? If right now, Draw night to God and you will draw night to you. Uh huh. What's the context of that, sir? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Hold on. One at a time. Here's, here's a question for you. How many of us know about a rental contract? A rental contract. A rent be rental contract between landlord and tenant. How many of us know that? Now, everything that we're talking about here, just, 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 re just respond in the comment section. Everything that we're talking about here is, re is very relevant to exactly where we're going tonight. Yeah? Me? Yes. All right. Okay, great. The moment you sign the contract, how many of you had to actually go and spend time with the landlord to build a relationship with him to get the, the apartment or did you sign the contract that indicated that relationship has begun you are in relationship with the landlord and you can occupy the premises immediately which one was it immediate occupation with full rights and privileges with responsibilities or did you go by the landlord and spend time trying to build a relationship with the man so that you can get an apartment? Which one was it? Just respond in the comment section. <laughs> this will help you put things into perspective really quickly. The first immediate occupation and by law that covenant that contract yeah upon signature which which is the same thing as a covenant but you were not introduced to christ as a covenant you were introduced to christ as a moral standard so what you try to do was to apply your western perspective of relationship to god so just as you will go and meet somebody and want to spend time with them to build a relationship, your definition of relationship based on Western culture, the Bible is speaking about immediate occupation upon covenantal agreement. So what we do in the Western world is that what you're trying to do is to find a sense of emotional connection with this person spending enough time with them so you get an emotional connection based on some level of trust whilst a contract 
or in this case the covenant you sign the covenant and as soon as you sign the covenant that is the immediate assumption and understanding not even assumption an understanding and acknowledgement of mutual trust and you immediately occupy is this registering in your mind that's why you see nobody in the bible talking about building a relationship with god because the e relationship is the covenant is this registering type registering <laughs> you don't see jesus walking around jerusalem saying hey you need to build a relationship with god no big boy you don't see that <laughs> nobody walking around here's the next thing that comes with this has have you any have you seen anywhere in the bible where jesus is saying god loves you or the apostles going and telling people hey god loves you no we do that in the western culture because you were never introduced to, you were not introduced to christ via covenant you introduce christ as this person and so you spend time with this person and you're trying to do is get validation and most of us who are actually saying god loves you it's because you've actually come from some denomination or some background where you have been invalidated for so long that the invalidation and the feeling of invalidation has registered on you for so long that you are pursuing not feeling it and therefore your definition of love has now become emotional validation whilst jesus and these guys as soon as they come into covenant they understand that the covenant is god's love so they're not struggling with that the agreement is love that's why all through the old testament god says if you love me keep my commandments meaning keep keep the covenant if you love me keep the covenant if you love me keep the covenant <laughs> and the new covenant is simple but you do even understand what it means which is what we're going to cover here tonight the new covenant is to confess with your mouth the name listen to me many bible translations have actually taken that confess with your mouth the name confess with your mouth the lord jesus and changed it to mean confess with your mouth that jesus is lord yeah confess with your mouth that jesus is lord they changed it but the king james version maintains the authenticity and it says confess with your mouth the lord jesus the only reason why they would change something like that is because you're not using the old covenant the old testament as a reference point to understand what these guys are saying because all of them have memorized torah and memorized prophets and therefore there is nothing that these guys are saying that is not coming from the torah or is not coming from the prophets the torah meaning the five first five books of the bible and the prophets the rest and of course this includes the sacred writings but there's nothing that jesus says and there's nothing that paul that paul and peter is saying that is not from the torah because this is what they memorized to exist in the old covenant and in the old covenant if they mention anything outside of our covenant then they covenantal they, they are in covenantal infringement there is nothing that comes out of jesus's mouth that is not in the covenant so you're reading that and you, we take it because of how philosophical we want to sound and we say to confess with your mouth that jesus is lord that is not what it said it says to confess with your mouth the lord jesus go get your bible and turn to romans 10 and you will see it yourself open the bible and check it out romans 10 to confess with your mouth the lord jesus king james version so tonight 
what we're gonna do here is to actually see how you approach power from covenant because what you have been doing is trying to approach power by philosophy and feeling and that's why most of you here in particular when it comes to walking in power you rely on a feeling to justify that you're in power whilst nobody in covenant ever does that there is only one commandment in the new covenant one commandment which is to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead what does that mean lower down Paul Paul parallels this with saying those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved that's a parallel don't take my word for it go to Romans 10 if you have a physical Bible why is you watching me here or you have another device go to Romans 10 and tell me if that is not what you're seeing somebody confirm that in the, com in the comment section before I move on King James Version are you not seen in Romans 10 to, co to confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and to believe in your heart that God has risen from the dead and then a few lines later he says those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved is that not there in that order how many of us here now for the first time Somebody give me a confirmation on how many of us hearing that for the first time. Now, those things that I just mentioned there may not mean much to you because of how philosophical you have been thinking. But those things that Paul told you there is far from philosophical. It is very practically engaged. Massively practically practically engaged right Romans 10 verse 9 aha uh -huh. and then scroll down and tell me you're not seeing as a parallel to those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved which means he said the two things in two different ways but there's the same thing that he's talking about no Right. read often but not understood as you explain it okay yeah we read it there is a meaning in the bible for ancient priests for jesus for paul all the apostles all prophets all priests for calling upon the name do you know where they get that from i thought you'll never ask let's go <laughs> so Basically, what I'm saying is, these are things Good night Okay, starting to make sense Okay These are things that you have been applying a philosophical understanding to and the Western culture has framed it like that and you're not doing what they would do when they hear that this is why you struggle to manifest power because you have nothing tangible to engage to know that the power is going to be 100 percent present how many of us can say here that when it comes to prayer or to heal or to do anything regarding the supernatural power of god you are never 100 percent single-minded How many of us can confess, just be real, that you always feel a level of instability? And you feel as though you have to conjure up more emotion to get over the thoughts of doubt. How many of us could say that? Write in the comment section. Be real. Be real. Because if you don't identify it in yourself, 
You cannot eliminate what you have not identified. How many of us can say that you're praying and you're feeling like you have to conjure? You're trying to work it up. And when you're praying, you're, 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 second, you're, you're doubting while you're praying. And when you finish praying, you're, you're doubting again. <laughs> right? And you are in... Like I need you... Exactly. Like you need the right words. And the only reason you're feeling that is because unknowingly to you, you have not something, you do not have a very practical understanding of how to engage the power. And all of your life, you've been reading the scriptures and using emotions to explain what it means. And so at some times, you feel inspired. And so you go quick. And, as, and tomorrow morning you get up and you're not feeling, and you're feeling like something offered me today. Have you ever seen any disciple or apostle, Yeshua himself, any prophet or any priest, get up in the morning? Is it written anywhere that these men saying, today are not feeling it? Just be straight. Is that written anywhere? Or does it say, when we, when we did the session concerning the posture of power, that the priest would go in front of the army and anybody he or she identifies. Yes, without power, without power, I felt it depended upon... Exactly. Exactly. He, and he's been honest. Because that is exactly the Western experience. Or did the priest go in front of the army and, and identified anybody who was who actually was um was in anxiety or discouraged and he told them go back home before you corrupt the strength of the rest of the army which means whatever understanding that they have they have no acknowledgement of anything about today I ain't feeling it what they are engaging is in so practical that the priest could send you back home. It's all about emotions, Lori. All about emotions. <laughs> it's all about emotions. They understood this practically to the point that the priest could actually identify you and say, go back home. You have no right here. They are practically engaging this. And here's my last point. Most of you have come from denominational backgrounds that also taught you to reference Moses' law a lot. Not taking into consideration that Jesus preached faith under Moses' law. Why is everybody keeping the law? He was preaching faith. Do you know that what he was doing had nothing to do with Moses' law? Who is the father of faith? Write it in the comment section. Who is the father of faith? This is another reason why you have been lost. Why you're feeling as though you're, in, you're unstable. Because... You came into Christ and they introduced you to Moses' law. Why is Jesus himself preaching faith? Abraham, which means under Moses' law, Jesus preaching an Abrahamic message. He even said about the one who was bent over, why is this daughter of should not this daughter of? <laughs> hey, you have to laugh. 
you really have to laugh when you really sit down and think where we have come from. You know? All along you preaching Moses and that is why you're unstable. Because you're supposed to be replicating Abraham because you are Abraham's seed. But you were taught to live in the law. <laughs> Yeshua himself replicating Abraham. So much that when he tell them about Abraham's seed, right? And they say, but we are Abraham's seed because we are his children. He says, if you were Abraham's seed or children, you would actually do the works of Abraham. Jesus talking about Abraham and the whole denominational circle had you occupied with Moses' law. Which means Jesus, under Moses' law, walking out the Abrahamic promises. Faith. He walking out Abraham's covenant and Abraham's promises. And you watching Jesus all of your life. And it never occurred to you that Jesus is referencing one law from Moses, really. He just using it in arguments. When they come up, and he, he's, showing them, he's showing them that he knows that he knows what he's talking about and what, is, what they're saying is, is, is misguided. But when Jesus is actually functioning, he's talking about faith. Have faith in God. O ye of little faith. That is Abraham he referencing. And some of you will say what? He was supposed to keep the law. The law? Listen to what Paul says. The law came about as a result of the Abrahamic promises. Which means if Jesus lived by Abraham, by default, he is keeping the entire law. Lay digest. Lay digest. <laughs> right now, I just destroy your whole life of doctrine right there. I just destroyed your whole life of doctrine. Gone. Because you are Abraham's seed. Paul says that. Therefore, if you are Abraham's seed and Abraham is the father of faith and there's many New Testament letters that reference Abraham from Hebrews to Galatians to Romans referencing Abraham. If Say again please, if Jesus was functioning from Abraham under the Mosaic, in the Mosaic, in the Mosaic system Galatians chapter 3 says Paul says that the law came about as a result of Abrahamic promises which means if Jesus is living by the Abrahamic promises by default he is fulfilling the whole law Let's settle in. Let's settle in. <laughs> Let's settle. Give it some thought. If Paul says that the law was actually put in place And Jesus living by the Abra by actually responding to Abraham because faith was not at the cup of, of, of Moses' law, but he walking by faith, which means he's referring to himself as Abraham's seed. And if the law was a consequence of that, no matter how it is, what the consequence is, by he walking by the Abraham promises, by default he is walking by let's say it's like it's like um. This is like a hierarchy. Abrahamic promise at the top, Moses' law at the bottom. You can live in Moses' law, or you can live in the Abrahamic promise. If you live in the Abrahamic promise, you fulfill the whole law. Hmm. 
most of us also are not aware of that Galatians chapter 3 says that the Holy Spirit is Abraham's promises and the Holy Spirit was never a promise of the Mosaic law do you know that they digest the Holy Spirit Paul in Galatians chapter 3 go check it yourself <laughs> go check it yourself in Galatians 3 Paul says that that you that the Gentiles will receive the the, the, the the blessings of Abraham and he refers the blessings of Abraham as the Holy Spirit Yet you live in any mosaic law and referring to Moses' commandments under the under denominational circles. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was not a reward. It was a gift. If it was under the law, He'd be a reward. If it's true Abraham's promises, it is true a gift. If you get that, type get it. Does that mean that communion is in the name? I need it to be more I I, I would like to believe what you're saying there, Holy Sister, but I like I need to be more specific for me to confirm what you're saying. If you're getting that, type get it. No, Jesus entered the Moses. No, Jesus didn't put an end to the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. That is why Paul in Romans 10 could interchange, could, could quote the law and interchange keeping the commandments with faith in Christ. Because the law was not ended, the law was fulfilled so that you, by faith in Christ, could be in the covenant. See what I'm saying? So instead of keeping it, when you're reading it, instead of saying, reading, if you keep my commandments, Paul demonstrates in Romans 10 by quoting Deuteronomy 30 that the law is the end, the law is the end, um, sorry, that, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Meaning that you no longer have to keep the commandments because he fulfilled it. And therefore, when you're reading it, he showed you take out keeping the commandments and put faith in the name. So now you could actually manifest the promises of God as a fulfillment of the law. This is why Paul says in the, in, 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 in the beginning part of Romans, he says, that the law is fulfilled in you. You understand what I'm saying? So you fulfill the contract to go back to Abraham's covenant contract. All right. So obviously, based on what I'm seeing, I'm seeing some of the comments here, is that you all actually believe that Moses' law is independent of Abraham's promises and covenant. Do you not realize? Who received? Here's a question for you. Who received the covenant of circumcision? Communion is in Yahweh. When we talk particularly body and blood, we do so in Yahweh. Yes, but but actually in Yeshua, because Yeshua is Yahweh in flesh who received the covenant of 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 circumcision i've seen israel moses believe it was moses all right this is a good conversation right here it was Abraham. <laughs> right? 
So if you had a if you had a circumcise under Moses' law, and the covenant of circumcision was given to Abraham, what does that say about Moses' law? Let me just let me just settle that here tonight, right? Let me just settle that here tonight because if you can't get this, what I'm about to show you here will go straight down, will straight straight over your head. We're going to Genesis. Everybody, turn to Genesis. We're going to Genesis chapter. Fifteen. Or is it fourteen? No. Genesis chapter fifteen. We're going to see Abraham here. Sorry, not 15, 17. Genesis 17. Listen up. I read in here. Genesis 17. And when, and when Abraham was 90 years old and 9, Yahweh appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, which is Almighty God. El Shaddai means the all-sufficient one. Pay, take note of that, right? The all-sufficient one means the one who gives life, the one who pours out blessings, the one who nurtures. Walk before me and be thou perfect, and I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And, and Abraham fell on his face, and God talked on, unto him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger remember we read we read in one of the sessions before when we read in Genesis in, in our Exodus and Yahweh introduced himself concerning the promise that he would actually take them out of the land and bring them to the promised land. He referenced these things from he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. This is where you reference it right here. Right? And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan. Moses fulfilled that. Moses was fulfilling the Abrahamic promise. Get follow for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. God reminded Moses of these things. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man shall every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Yea. Every man shall in his generations, he that is born in the house, or brought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. 
everything that written here God was speaking to Moses about and you had to circumcise to come into the covenant which means let's go to Galatians 3 <laughs> so everybody seen that right type Abraham the covenant of how circumcision was given to Abraham not Moses It was included, and here's why. Now, this this part I'm going to read in the amplified version, so you get more, so you get more context. All right, everybody, seen Abraham, right? Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. Okay. Let's follow something in. It's a good thing we're having this conversation because I have no idea that it was not common knowledge that we are Abraham's seed and the Mosaic law was a consequence of... of is, okay. Let's read. What is right here? Reading from verse 7, chapter 3, Galatians 3, 7. Verse, three, verse, verse, um, verse 7, chapter 3. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version so that we get some amplification. <laughs> so listen to what it says. Know ye therefore. Okay, I'm going to read from verse 6 here now. According to the Amplified, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, as conformity to God's will and purpose, so is it with you also. So understand that it is the people who live by faith with confidence in the power and goodness of God who are the true sons of Abraham. What did you say? What did he just call you? Somebody write in the comment section. What, what, what did he just call you if you're walking in faith? That's my, it, all you had to do is read it. You know. <laughs> what did he call you just now? Sons, sons of who? Don't be afraid to say it, you know. Children of Abraham. Sons of Abraham. Okay. All right. Let's continue. <laughs> Let's know my, my tab, my tab stood on here. All right. Okay, so we move on. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, by faith, proclaim the good news of the Savior to Abraham. What? Abraham got the gospel message first? Yes, that in your Bible. Yeah, in your Bible. Let, let's continue. Pro proclaim the good news of the Savior to Abraham in advance with the promise saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are the people of faith, whether Jew or Gentile, are blessed and favored by God and declared free of the guilt of sin, and its penalty and place in right standing with him along with Abraham the believer which means if Abraham was first and the law came in after and you are Abraham's son you are above the law <laughs> yeah 
Yes, that was there all the time. So what you doing in Moses' law? What you don't realize is that Moses' law was a consequence of the Abrahamic promise. Okay. Let's go on. For all who depend on the law, seeking justification and salvation by obedience to the law, and the observance of rituals are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed, condemned to destruction, is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, so as to practice them. Which means, let me break this down for you. Moses' law, Israel's side of the covenant, is 613 commandments that comes with actual sacrifices of animals for forgiveness of sins. What he's saying here is that if you keep in Moses' law and you not keep in 613 and you don't have an altar and you, you don't have an altar to go to to sacrifice them animals and there is no temple for you to go to an altar or, or I can't even say you could have the altar in your backyard but you have no temple to go to carry the star priest to get an animal sacrifice you living under a curse let me tell you and I love it that they only use that yeah <laughs> right let me tell you if you not keeping that system if you just picking and choosing from that law and not keeping the whole law you living under a curse huh? so just by that statement should you even be referencing commandments somebody talk to me talk to me <laughs> Should we even be referencing that commandment? Come on. Leave it alone, big boy. <laughs> what you doing there? <laughs> right? Okay. Now it is clear that the one that no one is justified that is declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty and place in right standing before God by the law oh good Jesus which means if you referencing commandments to be righteous before God you are admitting that you are not under Jesus that you are a sinner and that you are trying to demonstrate to God that you do not need Jesus for salvation get be watch me holy sister say it again get behind me <laughs> what a mixed bag of doctrine we have been served on the west tell me about it tell me about it no one is validated by keeping the law and holy sister lisa do you know that what jesus is doing on that cross is validating you so that you could walk in power and if you under the law you have ignored his validation therefore you are invalidated and what did god what did the serpent do to the man for the man to lose power invalidated invalidated him so if you're going to the law you're going back for more invalidation and you're going to get sick and die because the curses as a result the curses basically invalidation when the serpent invalidated them and they acted upon the invalidation by going and looking for something to validate them god said cursed the earth is cursed because of you which means the invalidation is a curse is a cursed life They digest. Take your time. Anybody need some tea? 
I know this this might be some hard pills here tonight. Anybody want to go and get some some tea or or some wine? <laughs> you might need you might need a little sip to help you to. No, I'm just joking. Eh? I do I I ain't condoning alcoholism here. Eh? I just saying that. But sip something. <laughs> Even if you need a glass of water right now, sip it. You might need it. <laughs> right? So, let's read on. Let me read on. It gained better. For all who depend on the law, seeking justification and salvation by obedience to the law and the observance of rituals under a curse. Are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed. Condemned to destruction is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law so as to practice them. Which means law requires practice. Which means, big boy, you're never going to stop. If you had to keep that, you had to keep it 316 and you had to make it a practice till you're dead. Because under the law, death is a fruit. Okay. Let's read on. Now it is clear that no one is justified that is declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty and placed in right standing before God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. For the righteous shall live by faith. It is, is it because the, the people rejected the covenant of Yahweh that they went on the law to perfect themselves? No. Paul will explain it here. Hold on. <clears throat> Paul, is, Paul is going to explain it here. But the law does not rest on or require faith. So if you say you're walking in faith and you say you're keeping the law, big boy, you're confused. You need to go and take a sleep. You're clearly confused. You're trying to mix both wines. I just saying. Let me continue. All I do is reading here, you know. I'm not even interpreting this here. Right? This is has this has always been here. Let's read. <laughs> but the Lord does not rest or require faith. It has nothing to do with faith. But instead, the law says, he who practices them. The things prescribed by the law shall live by them instead of faith. Which means you have to choose. Law, faith. Faith, law. You can't have lath or four. <laughs> you get it? Law. Take out the F from faith and put law. Lath. You can't have that. Take out the take out the, 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 the F from faith and put it on law. Four. You can't have that either. You had to choose. Stop trying to mix it. Christ purchased our freedom and redeemed us from the curse of the law and its condemnation by becoming a curse for us. What was the curse? Invalidation. Injustifi not, not, not having justification. Invalidation and a lack of justification. That's a flaw. Yeah, that is it right there. That's a flaw. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so, 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 so what is here? Christ became the invalidation. He said Christ became the curse. We know that the curse, the, the serpent invalidated the man. And the man acted upon the invalidation by going and looking for a tree to validate him. So Christ became the curse, which means Christ became the invalidation. And okay. Christ purchased our freedom. Freedom from what? from pursuing validation and redeemed us from the curse of the law 
and his condemnation by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Curses everyone who hangs crucified on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus, look at, pay attention, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might also, be, might also come to the Gentiles, so that we would all receive the realization of the promise of the Holy Spirit through faith. Which means if you keep in the law, you cannot access the Holy Spirit. And if you have the Holy Spirit, it's because you, you got the Holy Spirit by faith. And the Holy Spirit is Abraham's blessings. Good Jesus. Why need to go here? Why? See Karamako. Kombo barakandi si yimi mama kaka na maka. Are you talking tongues now? <laughs> Watch me. These things right in the Bible. I not even. I not even add. Watch me. I ain't even interpreting. We just reading. Is everybody? Is is this is this settling in your mind? So now let's answer Holy Brothers, Holy Holy Brother Norman's question and continue to read. This is from verse 15. You said, see what I'm saying? <laughs> right? Watch this. Brothers and sisters, I speak in terms. This is to answer Holy Brother Norman's question, right? I speak in terms of human relations. Even though a last will and testament is just a human covenant, Yet, when it has been signed and made legally binding, no one sets it aside or adds to it, modifying it in some way. Which means, after the testament was set out, was this, the um, Abrahamic promises were set out, nobody could add to that. Now, the promises in the covenants were decreed to Abraham and to his seed. God does not say unto seeds as of many or descendants or heirs as if referring to many persons but as to one and to your seed singular who is none other than Christ okay so now he's saying that Christ Jesus is Abraham's seed which is why Christ which is why Christ basically could tell the Pharisees, if you were Abraham's seed, you'll do the works of Abraham. He was indicating that all of the miracles that he's doing is actually true. The works of is actually true doing the works of Abraham. Okay. These things have been right in front of you. I just saying. This is what I mean. The law which came into existence 430 years later after the covenant concerning the coming Messiah which means Abraham's seed was, was God's promise to Abraham that the Messiah will come so how it is you identifying with the Messiah who is Abraham's seed and you living in Moses' law Moses' command, the commandments to Israel let's watch this after the covenant concerning the coming Messiah, does not and cannot invalidate the covenant previously established by God, so as to abolish to, so as to abolish the promise, which means he's saying that Abraham's law does not contradict the promise. It is not contradicting it. Oops, hold on. He says, for if the inheritance of what was promised is based on observing the law as these false teachers claim as most westernized Christianity teaches it is no longer based on a promise however God granted it to Abraham as a gift by virtue of his promise why then the law what was its purpose? This is the answer, Holy Brother Norman, you know. It was added 
after the promise to Abraham to reveal to people their guilt because of transgressions that is to make people conscious of the miss of the sinfulness of sin and the law was ordained through angels and delivered to Israel by the hand of a mediator Moses the mediator between God and Israel to be in effect until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made so basically he's saying is the law of Moses all of the promises of the law of Moses is an expansion of the Mo of the Moses' law but it was put into a covenant where Israel had commandments so that they can see that God so that, so that they can see that God made the promise to Abraham on his own integrity the only thing that Abraham had to do was to circumcise himself and his house which means you read in Abraham and Abraham is circumcised Isaac is circumcised Jacob is circumcised everybody is circumcised in his household even his servants if they actually have to live with him pay attention here now what is circumcision circumcision is the cutting off of the foreskin it is called remember God tell him circumcise the flesh of the foreskin right that flesh is an allusion to the flesh that God put on the man outside the garden you have been taught your flesh is your body no big boy by scriptural standard the flesh is in reference to the skin that God put on the man outside of the garden which identifies a mindset anything that you see somebody being closed with in the scriptures is is alluding to a mindset that they have the reason for that is the law the garden of eden teaches that every spirit reproduces after his own kind so basically because the man's mindset changed to the serpent mindset because he made the serpent his reference point and his father god it was and it was indicative of the fact that by taking on the serpent mindset you have taken on the serpent spirit you have taken on the serpent identity abraham was told to circumcise to come into the promise so circumcision represents taking off the flesh that god put on put on the man or the garden which is representative of taking off the mindset abandoning that mindset and taking on the mindset of Yahweh is everybody following us so far in other words no longer are you actually using the animal mindset which is what animals in the sacrificial system represented the animal identity because the man made an animal his father everybody following type follow <clears throat> I went back to naked and being unashamed <laughs> not literally of course is everybody following which is what no anytime you hear anything about anybody clothing themselves in the Bible or being clothed that represents a mindset even when Jesus actually told them even when Jesus actually told them hey wait here so that you're clothed with the Holy Spirit that means that the Holy Spirit is going to come upon them and they have to embrace the mindset Holy Spirit Holy means exclusive to God's Spirit which means exclusive to God's promises okay follow alright 
So Abraham therefore circumcises representing cutting off the animal mindset and actually embracing the Yahweh identity. When Israel circumcised, it represented cutting off the animal mindset, which is why they use animals on the sacrifices I mentioned. You're cutting off the animal mindset and embracing the title Yahweh. Okay. Jesus was on the cross as an animal. Not so? The lamb that was slain just as the serpent was lifted in the wilderness so must the son of man be lifted up. How were you doing? How is it different? Okay. Let's continue reading. <laughs> so basically he's saying, sorry, I was actually explaining here. So now that you understand that, the law did not contradict the blessings. The law came in to show that God made a promise to Abraham on his own integrity because mankind did not, could not actually reproduce it on their own. And so the law came in, basically what he's saying here is to show them that you cannot do it on your own. He told Abraham that he's going to fulfill it and showed them and put the same promises and made it all of the promises of the Torah, all of the promises of, the, of Moses' covenant. But Israel said that the covenant had 613 things, 613 laws. I'm, I'm, I'm at the risk of oversimplifying this, I'm basically showing you that Moses' side of the covenant, sorry, Israel's side of the covenant, remember it's God's side, which is all of Abraham's promises. God's side of the covenant is all Abraham's promises, just ex expounded in many different ways. Everybody following that? Israel's side of the covenant is, well, Israel's side of the covenant was basically the things that Israel needed to stop doing which is the things that the man in the Garden of Eden wouldn't do so that the covenant would upgrade them to a kingdom of priests back in the Garden to experience all Abraham's promises. Because Abraham's promises and the because covenant of Abraham was based on cutting off the animal mindset. So the law wasn't against Israel. The law was actually to show Israel that God has given you a promise. Even though you are not reproducing it. And he put them under the law. So technically that so that people so that they can see that it's not something that they can reproduce. In other words, it showed it pretty much identified that how much or how um, they were really of a different spirit. It wasn't supposed to make them righteous. In, in, in the next chapter of Galatians, it says God put it there as a taskmaster to keep them under control as well. Because God could fulfill that promise and they could go and kill the whole world. Literally. And God will still fulfill his promise. As one, simultaneously, because God is keeping that promise according to his own integrity. Simultaneously, all of Abraham's promises is actually the nature of the man in the garden. So basically, the law of Moses was actually put in place simultaneously to show them that God is actually bringing them into the garden experience and they, having the animal identity or living from that, or having been found themselves outside of the garden, they were not capable of reproducing it like the man in the garden would reproduce it. So the seed, which is the Messiah, would then come and show them that you cannot reproduce that 
in the animal identity the animal identity has to die and god actually replaced the spirit in them so that they can now reproduce it like you and i we could reproduce it again from our spirit is this making sense So basically looking at two things. One was to keep them under control because they could, go, they could go and do evil things and God's promise is still going to be fulfilled. And two, <clears throat> and two, it literally showed them that God is actually giving them something of the garden. And it's, it, it highlighted how much the animal identity is incapable of doing that because it is a completely different spirit from the man in the garden. And Jesus, and Jesus was necessary to come and change the spirit so that they could live in the garden freely like you and I right now. Is that making sense? This is what Paul is really talking about, really talking about here. Confirm in the comment section and let's make it type sense to me, please. So the law was never meant to make anybody righteous. It was supposed to keep them under control, to train them, as well as to highlight the fact that another spirit could never reap the results of a different spirit. Okay. Now, by the way, according to this right here, if your spirit is different, then Moses' commandments to Israel, the 613 commandments, Israel had to keep if that spirit that those commandments were written to no longer exists then there is no species for it to, re for it to be applied to so if you truly believe that you are in christ following moses law is actually following commandments to a different species Is this clear? This is what Jesus basically had to do. Because the man in the garden was God, and he made a decision that was God, he was God, everything that comes out of God's mouth, or every decision God makes, is actually called a statute. It's like an ordinance. And the man was God. When he made a decision, it became a statute. And the man reproduced a new species. That statute would have been forever to the species that was created. It was so much of a statute that not even God could stop it. God had to get, God actually had to eliminate the species that the statute was over to free everybody from the statute. Create a new species so death has no, no, um, so that death has no species that it could rule over and the commandments are no longer necessary because it was actually given to a species that was naturally death. Jesus put that species to death and then resurrect humanity with a different spirit, changing the species completely. This is a new species. So that now, if you're trying to follow that law, you are no different from a lion trying to follow a dog's handbook. 
Is that making sense? I'm slowing down here. Now, I have not begun to touch the topic that we're supposed to touch here tonight. But it's a very good thing that we actually fell on this topic right here. And I really ask those questions. Because if you can understand this right here, you are confused. And I could show you in the scriptures how power is practically engaged. And it will go straight over your head and it will be a wasted teaching. Because this right here is basics, partner. And unfortunately, this is where the whole Western Christian church lives. On the basic things. Is everybody following? Type follow. Yeah, everybody, I need everybody responding. Make sure I want to make sure everybody everybody following. We don't want to be shooting shooting bullets in tenure here. <laughs> right? So Holy Brother Norman, I hope I actually answered your question. Just confirm that I answered your question, please. So it wasn't that the, the sin, you see, you see, Western Church has not identified that the man in the garden that fell out into the garden became a different species that is a parallel species it wasn't God again they haven't identified that as yet so right now like I see all over Facebook people, 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 all over Facebook I see like this big movement start about Christ consciousness big boy watch me hmm. anyway we come back to that All right, so watch this. Yes, thank you. Okay, so let's read on. So I'm start, we're starting from verse 19 again. Why then the law? What was its purpose? It was added after the promise to Abraham to reveal to people their guilt. So basically God showing you that you are incapable of getting that. So every time when that law was established, it just further compounded that God was doing what he was doing all of his own integrity. You could never access that on your own because you are a different spirit. You're like a dog trying to be a lion. You don't have that spirit. Your body will never develop like that. That is what, that, that is what the law kind of confirms, that you are a different species. And because you're a different species, you need a new spirit. So this is what he says here. <clears throat> it was added after the promise to Abraham to reveal to people their guilt because of transgressions. That is to make people conscious of the sinfulness of sin. Sin here is an identity. So he makes you conscious that you are of a different species. Okay? And the law was ordained through angels and delivered to Israel by the hand of a mediator, Moses, the mediator between God and Israel to be in effect on the seed until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now watch this. Notice he is saying that God gave Abraham the promise of the Messiah. A new spirit, not a renewed soul. Correct. Alright. Um what I was saying? Right. Notice, he's saying, I'm just reading it again. He says, It was, and the law was ordained through angels and delivered to Israel by the hand of a mediator, Moses, the mediator between God and Israel, to be in effect until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Which means he's saying that Abraham's promises was made to the Messiah. The new species. And Israel, because they were a different species, could never access that. And the law further compounded to them that they could never access it on their own. Because they couldn't even stop doing the things that the man in the garden wouldn't do. 
So it further compounded, it not only kept them under control, but it further compounded that the Messiah had to come to put the species to death so that they could access it with the new spirit. Because remember, the man in the garden was God's breath breathing to dust. So that was Yahweh in flesh. So he could reproduce power and life freely. When the man made a decision and became the person of death, that was a different species. And so God gave the promise to Abraham and showed them that his promises to Abraham is to the seed. And the seed is actually a garden species. So the law was then put in place to keep them under control, as Paul says, so that they don't go killing the entire planet. Let me just put it like that. And God will still fulfill it. But also so that they could see that you cannot, a lion or, 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 or let's say a hyena or a dog cannot roar like a lion. So the promises is to the lion. And so for you to access lion promises, you have to come back to be a lion. So the law was actually, the law literally confirmed and made it very clear that you are a different species. Okay. <clears throat> then he says, Now the mediator or go between in a transaction is not needed for just one party, whereas God is only one and was the only one given the promise to Abraham. But the law was a contract between two, God and Israel. Its validity depended on both. So now he's saying, pay attention, now he's saying, <coughs> that this further confirms the point that God made the promises to Abraham, but God made the promises on his own integrity. And so a mediator is not necessary for God and God, because it's God that can make any promise on his own integrity, and therefore it is based on God. But Israel is a different species. If Israel was God, then he could just make the promise and because it's God and God, there is no necessity for a mediator. But since they are different species, then basically what God did with Moses was if, if God is a lion and God need to talk to the hyenas, he called one of the hyenas and tell him how to be a lion so that he could be the go-between between God and the hyenas. Because the hyenas can't understand God. They're different species. Moses submitted to taking on the name and wanted to know God's ways. So he could become the adequate go-between to talk. He's, 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 he's like, he understands the ways of the lion so he could communicate that to the rest of the hyenas. But if when God made a promise to Abraham, God was not God actually made promises on his own integrity, so that promise is lion, lion to lion. With Israel or the that that that, that lineage of man from the fort, from from outside the garden, they are hyenas. So God find a mediator to communicate between yeah between the lion and the hyena. Does that make sense? I don't use that to make it kind of understandable. Now I want you all to see here, so far, this is not about a moral compassion. No? You see, because Western Christianity has no idea that this is because you are different species, you are different spirit. And you cannot reproduce a raw if you have a dog spirit. You have to come back to having a lion spirit so you could raw. Because Western Christianity doesn't know anything about that, they made the Bible a moral compass. 
And that is why you are suffering with emotional validation problems right now. Is this making is this clear so far? Nothing have nothing here has to do with emotional validation. There's nothing to do with moral compassing. This is very practical spiritual dynamics. Or species dynamics, you could put it like that. Everybody following type follow. <laughs> Right? So now he says, not the mediator or go between in the transaction is not needed for just one party. Whereas God is only one. And was the only one given the promise to Abraham. But the law was a contract between two, God and Israel. But the law was a, um, its validity depended on both. Is the law then contrary to the promise of God? This is where he starts to answer the question again. Is the law, this is now I'm coming back from it. We now come back to, to, to the first premise that, that we started with. Because most of you apparently thought that Moses' law and the Abrahamic promise was two different things. And so if you, you didn't really understand its, its interconnection. So now he's now going to conclude it here. Is the law contrary to the promise of God? Certainly not. For if a system of law had been given which could impart life, then righteousness, right standing with God, would actually have been based on law. But the scripture has imprisoned everyone, everything the entire world, under sin. Not sin as in moral, as not sin as in moral, um, moral infringement. Sin as in a different identity. So that the inheritance... The blessing of salvation, which was promised through faith in Jesus Christ, which is the new species, might be given to those who believe in him and acknowledge him as God's precious son. Now remember, notice it says, who believe in him. Do you know that believe in him is a the belief in him here is a statement that was that actually is found by Abraham. We go there just now. Watch and see something. Hold on. Now, before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. We, as in we Jews, were kept in custody under the law, perpetually imprisoned in preparation for the faith that was destined to be revealed. With the result that the law has become our tutor and our disciplinarian to guide us to Christ so that we may be justified, that is, declared free of guilt, of the, of the guilt of sin and its penalty, and placed in the right standing of God by faith. Which means the law technically kept them under discipline to be what God called them to be. Until the one who would come, which is Yeshua, to change the species. If it was, if there was no law, what we would have is a new species, and everybody's wild. Like they just, they they have so much of habits, of killing and stealing and this and that and the next. That they wild, <laughs> right? For you who are born again have been reborn from above, spiritually transformed, renewed, sanctified, and all children of God, set apart for His purpose, with full rights and privileges, through faith in the new species, which is Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, baptized means to submerge, but check your dictionary, baptized also means to change your name. Which means you no longer call yourself an Adam, you call yourself a Yeshua. That is not something philosophical. That is very practical. For all you who all you who were baptized into Christ, meaning you have changed your name to Christ, into a spiritual union with the Christ, the anointed, have clothed yourselves with Christ. Well, what we just mentioned about clothing yourself. It means to take on a mindset. It means to take on a system of logic. 
which means you have to take on the system of logic of Christ, which is found in the name. That is, have taken on his, character, his characteristics and values. There is now no distinction regarding to salvation, neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. So amongst believers, all this wildness that's going on in the world here about man and woman as two different species does not exist in Christ. The only reason they're doing that is because they're functioning from the mindset of the man outside of the garden who is trying to be always an individual. The man in the garden does not function from individualism. He functions from the identity of the species. Is that making sense? Type sense. <laughs> Type sense. <clears throat> So obviously, we are going to have to have a part two of this sense. I've seen one person saying sense. Everybody? Sense. Two persons saying sense. Sense. All right. Shout out to Holy Sister Tammy. Blessings and much love. I trust all I trust it all as well, Holy Sister. There is no okay. So four senses lovely. So there is now no distinction in regard to salvation. Neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you who believe are all one species in Christ Jesus. No one can claim a spiritual superiority. No one can claim superiority. And if you belong to Christ, if you are in him, then you are Abraham's seed and spiritual heirs according to God's promise. And God's and Abraham's blessing is what? Male and female, is that the Schofield interpretation? Wh which interpretation is that? Schofield? You might need to give me some more clarity on the Holy Sister. <clears throat> so, everybody clear on this so far? So, we're looking at basically we are Abraham's seed. And heirs according to the promise. And the promise was Abraham's blessing, which is the Holy Spirit. Is everybody clear on this so far? So therefore, this, this, this comes down to the fact that if you want to walk in power, then who should we be looking at right now in biblical terms? Moses? the law or should we be watching the father of the faith that you are supposed to walk by are we looking at the law or are we looking at Abraham because everything that he's saying here he's pointing you to Abraham which means if you want to know how to walk in the spirit then you have to know then you have to watch Abraham is this making sense <laughs> you are Abraham's seed because you are Abraham's seed you receive the Holy Spirit which is the blessing of Abraham you know, I'm repeating it here Spirit Abraham's blessing Abraham's seed and according to the garden every spirit reproduces after his own kind so if you are Abraham's seed you are supposed to be doing the works of Abraham Yeshua identifies Abraham's seed 
Paul identifies Yeshua as Abraham's seed. That means that if the Holy Spirit was, did not come through the law, because it would have been a reward, and the Holy Spirit is a gift, then if you really want to understand power or how to engage the gospel message, you have to go back to the man who got the gospel message first, and that is Abraham. By the way, if Abraham was the one that got the gospel message first, and there is no hell in Abraham's message, something wrong with the one you listen to. And if nobody under Abraham's promises was called a sinner, and you believe you are a sinner, Look like we have walked 2,000 years in the desert of dead works instead of being... Watch me. Holy brother, I'll go in and pin that comment at the top. That comment deserves to... Let me see here. That comment deserves to be moved to first place. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that people need to understand... And I'm going to wrap up on this note right here, right? It's now New Schofield Study Bible by C.I. Schofield Anonymous. Schofield was a Freemason, male and female. Now, this has nothing to do with that. All right? All of these authors actually do not reference anything outside of the scriptures. So, whoever Schofield is and his definition, I guarantee you that it has nothing to do with the Bible. When Paul makes reference to male and female, he's actually speaking about the definition given to male and female in the scriptures. One of the things in particular, and this is this is actually to help everybody here. The Torah was actually called the Law of the Lord, which is a translation of the Torah of Yahweh. In the Bible, names, especially God's name, defines not only like an identifier to differentiate one person from the next, it also defines the role that he's playing in the scriptures. Like, if you hear a mechanic, you know that person fixes things. So if there's, a, if there's a mechanic and an engineer speaking, and there's a librarian, all of those terms define the roles that they play. So if you're hearing a story about a mechanic, you know that the mechanic has a role to fix things in that story. So the mechanic goes to this house, you know, if the mechanic goes to this house, anything that he encounters, he's definitely going to fix an engineer goes to a company and you know that he's going there and he's going to apply his expertise there. In the same way, Yahweh is actually defines his role in the scriptures. And if, if he is self-existent and eternal, then you know that anything that he says is self-existent and eternal. And also, anyone that is contradicting him is the opposite of what he is. Because he is only going to oppose that which is opposite of him, which means somebody is being codependent and temporal and because of the codependency they're actually causing harm to others because codependency means that you get what you what 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 that you need your priority to have a sense of validation and when you don't have validation you do what is necessary even trampling and killing others to get it because your validation is your source of life the other thing that the name, of, the name of God in the Bible does, it is actually a principle of thought. It's a cognitive law. Which means, if the Torah is called the Torah of Yahweh, it means the, the Torah of the self-existent and the eternal. That is a cognitive law. That also means that it defines how the Torah works and how it should be approached. Which means, anyone in scriptures Everyone in scriptures memorized. Literally, they memorized the Torah and the, and the prophets to work it out. And because it's called the Torah of the self-existent and the eternal, it was forbidden by the, by the cognitive law of the scriptures to use anything outside of the scriptures to define anything inside of the scriptures. 
if you have to use anything outside it's no longer self-existence it's now codependent therefore there's nothing that you will encounter here in the scriptures that you cannot find a definition of this is not taught in western in, in any western world and the torah in its original language is structured in a way that every first mention defines context and sets the precedent for how the concept would be used through the rest of the scriptures every prophet and every apostle know the, knew this and they wrote from that perspective and just just because of what i just told you there most of westernized christianity 99.9 .9 of westernized christianity is powerless and lost because they do not even know the rules of engagement for the scriptures to be able to benefit from it and so they're using all kind of external reference points and finding definitions from all kind of different spaces because they don't they were never taught that this is a self-existent text communicated by a self-existent person and because it's self-existent it has an internal system for you to be able to find definitions of anything that is mentioned we do not have literature like this in westernized civilization it is beyond our intellect I'm not saying that there are not people who are intellectually capable. I'm saying that the civilization has actually is not the civilization is not as a civilization it is not intellectually developed yet to be able to actually understand the simple concept right here. The only reason we were able to identify this is because I have been a translator for twenty something years, and I've and I understand the philosophy of a language. And the science of translation so whatever any person that writes a book and that book is not referencing the first the first mention and the context that that is actually encountered in the first mention as a precedent for the application to the rest of the text I guarantee you 1000 percent you are being misguided does that make sense? This is for everybody. Does that make sense, everybody? So, seeing that we actually had to start on this here, I have a, my question to everybody here. Is everybody clear? When I say clear, this right here is ABCs of your Bible. I'm not even, I am not even joking. What are we talking about here tonight are the ABCs of the Bible. If you do not have this very clear in your mind, you are always going to be confused about walking in power. Your confusion and mixture of these things is actually what is preventing you from walking in power. Which proves if you start wrong, you end up wrong. 100%. 100%. So, um, unfortunately, these things are not taught in the Western culture. As I said, the only reason we know it is because we took our translators approach to the Bible and actually went back to the ancient cultures, the ancient culture, to be able to understand the philosophy of the language, which gave insight into the philosophy of their mindset, because a language frames your thinking process. When we found it, then the Bible made perfect sense, and that's how I'm able to come here and help you walk in power. <coughs> So, regarding the basic concepts here of Abraham, the law, Abraham's promise, and your Abraham's seed, is anybody still confused? If you are still confused, I can still come back tomorrow and, and hash it out again, or further hash it out. But tomorrow, if everybody is clear, we can return tomorrow, and then we could talk about 
how you approach power. Now, power in, in the Bible is actually heavily and intimately tied to walking in the name. I started actually telling you that in Romans 10, Paul interfe interchanges confessing with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He interchanges with, with he who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Calling upon the name is a concept that started with 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 um in Genesis chapter 4. And Abraham is seen to call upon the name regularly. It is a very practical engagement that you were never taught. Once you understand this tomorrow, I am not I am not exaggerating. All of your struggles will stop immediately. All of the struggles where you're feeling as though you're not sure, you're not feeling as though you feel all of that will stop immediately. Exactly what Abraham did. Every every um the priest did. Yeshua did. And every single apostle did. That is why Paul is saying that the cross of Christ, he doesn't want to know anything but Christ crucified because it is the power of God to those who are saved. So tomorrow we will get into that and you will see how practical it is. See, I want to remind you all that Westernized Christianity, what you learn in denominational Christianity, let me give you a little hint here, right? If Israel and the Jews, the Judeans, were, circum were circumcised people, has it ever crossed your mind that no Roman could know their system? The circumcised community kept all interpretation of the scriptures as well as the meaning and how it worked within the circle of the circumcised because Moses' law prevented them from interfacing with outsiders. Why is it that you could believe that Christianity has anything to do with the Bible if it came from Romans predominantly and Romans could not and would not have actually been able to get that information from a circumcised community. That means that if they could not get the information from the circumcised community, they surmised the interpretation of the Bible. And the whole Western world learned their surmisings. I want you to give it serious thought. Nobody in the Western world has even sat down and actually fathomed the idea that Rome could not interpret the Bible. They were not Israelites, they were not Jews. And no Jew of their time would share circumcised information to uncircumcised people. Even if they encountered Paul's teachings and writings, they would not be able to understand. Because Paul was a Jew who memorized scriptures and knew the interpretation of the priests. He was a Pharisee for God's sake. So I encourage you to seriously consider that most, more than 90% of the things that you learn in Western Christianity 
our surmises. Is this making sense? Is this making sense at all? Here we are 2,000 years later. And we just read in scripture and come back to the writing right in front of you. But most of you were programmed with the Western Christianity. Look at that, I'm showing you and reading these things right in front of you here. Yeah. I know even trying to interpret or, or, or pull, pull an abundant scripture to create a picture. All I do is just reading and following the context. And you're seeing for yourself that everything that you have been taught is, contra is contradictory to what Paul is saying. And that's because you were, you were actually all this talk about Western, about church fathers. All this talk about church fathers. These men were Romans. These circumcised Jews kept all of their understanding and knowledge within the circle of the circumcised. This is why they stoned Paul. Because Paul was taking circumcised information and sharing it with outsiders. If they could stone Paul for that, you think a Roman... It could be the biggest emperor on the earth. They were going to tell him how the temple system worked. And what is the, what is the, what is the explanation of the Garden of Eden? And how you walk in the covenant? These were circumcised Jews. They don't share that with anybody. They stoned Paul. And beat Paul because Paul was doing that. Paul was the only man of the apostles that were doing that. And he was a Pharisee, which means he understood scripture. Memorized scripture just like any other Jew. And if that is the case, then you have to come to terms with the fact that everything that you were taught are from a, are from a people that took the scriptures assume the understanding of it and then used it to their benefit and nothing that you were taught originated from Moses and it sure as heck didn't come from Jesus Just in the previous sessions before, I showed you that most of your understanding of God came from a Roman God. I think his name is, I think that, that is Saturn. That Saturn God was called the God of life. If you go and research Saturn, you'll realize the whole concept that you have had about God came from the God Saturn. I, think, I believe that's the that that's the, the God. I did a session on packing that with people. I can't remember it off the head right now because I usually say in scriptures to really understand this, to apply it, and then present it to, to those who want to know how to do it. I showed in the last session that we went to Exodus 6. And the definition of Yahweh was there. And it is nothing compared to what you were taught. So if your definition wrong, your manifestation will be zero. I implore that you seriously stop and consider that what you have been taught and everything that you're taught, you're thinking. There are big movements across the line, across on, across Facebook, across social media, of even persons who are saying that they're actually in deconstruction. It sounds nice, right? It sounds like a legit. 
but if you're deconstructing lies with lies is it legit <laughs> if you're deconstructing the lie with the logic that build the lie all you're doing is pushing yourself deeper into lies in a different direction every sacrifice in the bible means the death to the animal mindset and engage the next one stark difference put down one logic and take up the next one that's what resurrection is about death to one start the next one if deconstruction was going to work for you that cross is not necessary and if the cross is necessary then deconstruction is sinking into the point of darkness because what people are doing is they deconstructing the same dark logic deconstructing the lies with the same logic that produced the lies the cross represents abandonment of the logic and that's where we get identify invalidate and re-educate that could take place in 15 minutes if you know what you're doing and your spirit would release that and now you different from a different logic as your default what i'm telling you here we have been applying over fifty thousand hours just to make sure it was working with people all over the world and the world of psychology does not know that because the world of psychology does not have an understanding of what the human spirit is and how it works ask a psychologist what is the law of physics of the spirit of man and he is lost if you you cannot understand earth if you don't understand the physics of gravity in the same way you cannot understand the human spirit if you do not know the physics of self-existence this is why the bible could get the devils out here we could uh, we could actually just come and tell that devil leave or you can just take up a different mindset let go that logic and take up the, the, the logic of yahoo of yeshua and you change spirit that devil it cannot stay where there's a different logic these things are dynamics that jesus worked with all the apostles work with the prophets the priests and unknown to our western culture and technically this is the first time i'm actually doing lives with this type of depth because i would usually keep it very very light because believers wasn't ready for it believers still talking about visualization and consciousness distracting themselves and still suffering but they don't realize that they're suffering still because all of these things give them good feelings so you you're, they're really attached to the feelings instead of actual hard dynamics and physics to change things and everybody who working with the feelings cannot heal the sick cannot raise the dead and cannot cast out of them do you understand what i'm saying there's nothing wrong with consciousness and these things but if you're using that as as the means and as the reference point to walk in god you are walking in darkness and you're going to suffer with that darkness because a spirit does not work like that all you're doing is feeding the spirit with an imagination and guess what the spirit is doing to understand the imagination it's using the same logic that is reproducing your suffering any others making sense at all
right? So, la, uh, whilst, whilst I'm actually asking that last call, with regards to the basics of what we covered here tonight, is everybody clear? Please write clear in the comment section. And if what I said makes sense, please also feel free to, um, to, write, to write sense. All right, we've seen excellent from Holy Brother Norman. All right. Everybody else? Clear and sense. All right. Great. Everybody else? All right. Sense. Holy Brother Chris. Sense. Okay. All right. So, on that note, let's wrap it up here tonight. And I'll be back tomorrow night at 10, 10 Eastern Time. Um, and we will continue tomorrow concerning calling the name. What does that mean in the Bible? Calling on the name in the Bible is a concept that starts with, with, um, with, with, a priest, with the priesthood. In Genesis, Abraham actually adopts it. Isaac did it. And in the New Covenant, you are actually, it also calls, it's actually also called calling, calling upon the name. This is a very concrete concept that is unknown in Western culture. So I strongly encourage you to return tomorrow and come prepare to take notes. Because when we be walking through a few scriptures and explain it, explain it to you, it's right in the Bible. Just that we have not been taught, you know, you were not taught to read the Bible like that. So, by tomorrow, I guarantee you 1000%, once we finish tomorrow, all of your struggles will stop. You will actually walk in power and have the same thing that Jesus used to do it. The same thing that Paul used, the same thing that the apostles used, the same thing that the priests used. 100%. You will have the same, the same system. And all you need to do is to practice doing it. Very simple, very straightforward. This is the thing about this whole Bible. These concepts are simple. It is westernized philosophy that actually took it and made it A complicated matrix and the sooner you want to walk in power the sooner you are going to have to make the decision to put down all of these things all right well it's October 1st all right brother I like your spirit October 1st that's a good day to start a new day <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so on that note i shall see you all tomorrow huge shout out to holy to, to holy brother chris borden kutcher holy sister monica poyton holy brother norman pigeon holy sister tammy holy sister odelia jackson holy sister jennifer holy sister sybil holy sister courtney Holy Sister Lori, Holy Brother Francis, Holy Brother Chris Burton, blessings and much love, Holy Sister Lisa, most people, a lot of people might be followed already, yes? So tomorrow I'm going to come in here and I'm going to try my endeavor best to finish this in two hours. So prepare, come prepare tomorrow because we'll be picking it up with a piece. But I want to make this four sessions, Papa. <laughs> I want to make this four sessions. So, much love, blessings. Boom. Yeshua.